zoom over to New York. Um, and um, in New York, we have um, Mr. Mike Dowling. Um, and Mike Dowling is uh, Chief Executive of Northwell Health. Um, he is also uh, a member of our North American Advisory Board. Um, and he has incredible experience in leading the largest provider of healthcare in the state of New York through this pandemic. over the course of a few months, which he believes is the most COVID patients treated by any healthcare system in the US. So we asked uh, Sean Kelly, um, who is the chair of our North American Advisory Board, uh, to sit down and have a conversation with Mike last week and to ask him about his experience in leadership in a truly remarkable crisis and to share the valuable lessons that he learned um, that may help us to prepare for an uncertain future. So we'll hand over to Mike now uh, in New York. Well, Mike, darling, great. It, as always, it's great to see you and thanks for, for joining us for this uh, conversation. Oh, thank you, Sean. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Yeah. You know, I think back, uh, actually, I was looking at my, my calendar on February 12th. We had an in-person meeting of the Smurfit North American Advisory Board in 345 Park Avenue, actually at the offices of um, Tourism Ireland. We were using their conference room. And I remember at that time, there was a discussion around, or one of the items, obviously, that people were talking about was what was happening in China with this virus that we were learning about and really the early days of that. And you sort of fast forward what seems like an age, but seven months, but unfortunately, you know, in the U.S., you know, 6.3 million cases later and all over 190,000 unfortunate fatalities from, from the virus. It, it does seem like another era. But you lived through that. You're living through that and you're learning from that. And, you know, I've, I've had the chance to read your, you know, your book around leading through the pandemic. And it's a fascinating sort of insights of what was happening on the front lines. So maybe could you share what it was like then? where you think we are now and where sure. we're going in, from a New York perspective, maybe a broader U.S. and global as we move into the winter, uh, you know, the autumn and the winter, and then maybe the lessons learned. So, uh, Mike, it would be great to, to hear your insights. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Sean. Um, we, uh, back in January, um, at, at my organization, we were, being, we were in contact with people in Wuhan and people in Italy. And we believe that, um, that it, it was probably going to come to New York. We were not exactly sure, but we, we knew we had to get prepared for it because with all the travel that was going on at that time between those countries and the U.S., it seemed like you know, a real probability that it would be in New York. So we started a plan for it in the middle of January. We didn't get our first case until the beginning of March. And it started very, very slowly. And I remember very vividly on St. Patrick's Day, because if you remember the St. Patrick's Day parade was canceled. On St. Patrick's Day, we had about 70 cases in our health system. And we have the biggest health system in New York, as you know. So we've got, you know, a vast array of services. And 70 cases was not a lot. Um, but we had put in place our emergency management infrastructure, just in case, on the assumption that it would grow. So what happened at the end of March, the number started to increase. And by the beginning of um, um, April, um, we were up to the hundreds of cases. And then the first week in April, it exploded. By April 6th, we had in our hospital, on our hospitals, 3,600 patients. So we went from, you know, in about two weeks, we went from 70 to 3,500. That was uh, in the inpatient, inside the hospitals, which meant that it basically took over uh, the, almost the full capacity of every one of our facilities. Fortunately, we were pretty well prepared for it. So what we had to do and was we had to close all other services uh, we had to make sure we created the, the extra beds that were necessary 
we created at one point about 200 new beds a day. We had to make sure we had the equipment, the masks, the PPE, etc. All of these became issues. And the most important one was that we had to make sure that we had the appropriate staff. And one of the reasons that we closed a lot of the other services, which was a huge financial uh, uh, disadvantage to us, of course, was that we needed the staff from those places to be able to be deployed and redeployed in the hospital uh, to take care of the patients on the front lines. So what was it like at that point? It was pretty hectic. And I had a kind of a dual role. I was, you know, obviously leading the not well experience, but then I was working very closely with the governor uh, because I do have an experience in government, as you know, and I did work with the Andrew Cuomo's father. So he contacted me and we had lots of discussions. I was in contact with him almost daily. And he, at that point, also took a real, real leadership role. Uh, I remember we got together with all of the hospitals. Of course, all of this was virtual because we had to go from in-person meetings to virtual, especially after a number of our senior leadership got sick. And, um, and one of them had to be hospitalized in serious condition. He survived. Everything was fine. But the governor took a real leadership role and basically telling every hospital in New York, you've got to expand your capacity by at least 50% within the next couple of days. Um, now, this is something that we never had to do before. Now, we've dealt with hurricanes and we've dealt with SARS and H1N1, et cetera, uh, but nothing to the extent of this. And um, I can tell you that the healthcare organizations in New York, and we all started to work together, um, that we basically, um, you know, uh, I think did a quite a good job in making sure that we were able to accommodate all of the patients. And at the beginning, the other big issue here, which I think um, people will, uh, may, may, may realize, is that we didn't know an awful lot about the disease at the beginning. So when patient, patients came in, we, we, did, we didn't know much. We didn't know exactly the details of the virus. We didn't know exactly what the treatment should be. We didn't know exactly what the process of the treatment should be. And over time, uh, we got much better at that. The mortality rate at the beginning for a person who went on a vent was about 70%. So I remember walking the halls of the hospitals because I was in every hospital all the time. I remember walking the halls of the ICUs in every hospital and watching all of those people on vents, some people in the ICUs, and having this, it was, and everything was, everything in the hospitals was quiet because you had no visitors. All visitors, visitation was canceled. None of the patients were, were talking much. It was quiet, eerily quiet. But you knew that a lot of the people on the beds that you were looking at were probably not going to make it. It was an experience that, despite the fact that we've all been in healthcare a long time, this was an experience that we never before had. Um, at, towards the middle end of April, the numbers started to decrease. And uh, today, uh, we have, a, across our whole health system, about 80 patients. Uh, we only have a couple of people on beds. So right now in New York, that is basically the COVID crisis is basically over at this point. But what, I would, what we've got to be very careful of is that this is never over until it's really over. So um, it's like we're at half time in a game at the moment. I mean, uh, we played this unbelievably difficult game for the last period of time. Now it's quiet. And so we're just making sure that we inform everybody that they have to wear masks, they have to social distance, they have to wash their hands. And as you know very well, a lot of people are not coming back into the offices. In Manhattan, the restaurants are open for outdoor dining, but not open for indoor dining. Now, out here in Long Island, you can have indoor dining. Um, and of course, there is this big discussion going on about the opening of the schools, the opening of the colleges, how you do this. And we monitor unbelievably closely every day to see whether or not there are any early warning systems about whether or not we might have another big upsurge. So right now it's in good shape. And uh, the economy is hurting, of course. A lot of businesses have come back, but most haven't. Um, what will happen in the fall? Um, we're assuming, and we have, we have, let me put it this way, we have planned 
uh, as if we're going to have a real major disastrous situation later in the fall. That's the only way you have to plan because if you don't plan for the, for the, for the major problem, then you're going to be left behind the eight ball here. What do I think is going to happen? This is an opinion. I think we will have an upsurge. I doubt that it will be anything like what we had before. Now, I could be wrong on this, uh, but I doubt that it will be that, that severe. And uh, that's our hope. And of course, it's not just the fall, it's also January, February, March. And I don't think anybody will feel completely secure until we have a vaccine. And I don't believe, despite uh, you know, our leadership's um, presentations about a vaccine by October, I don't see a vaccine until the, until the spring, at least the distribution of a vaccine until the spring. And if that happens, I think a lot of confidence uh, will come back into, into the area and, and in the United States in general. And one other thing, Sean, our, um, since we no longer have that many COVID cases, our regular business is coming back. So right now, I am at about 90% that I am, 90% of my business is back from where it was pre-COVID. In some parts of my business, we're back 100%. Our hospitals are packed. Um, the places that are quieter and where business is not coming back as fast is the emergency departments, because I think that's where people are a little bit nervous about coming to an emergency department. But I'm out in the hospitals every day and surgery is coming back. So we had about 35,000 surgeries that were deferred uh, during the COVID crisis because we didn't do any real surgery unless it was absolutely necessary. So all of that is coming back, and that's a good sign. The public has having confidence that the place is safe, they're secure, there's uh, limited uh, uh, possibilities of transmission, etc. So that's where we are right now. No, Mike, that's really helpful. I, um, I think many of us know and have heard you speak before and, and say, looking at statistics, I think you know, Northwell has dealt with more COVID I'm sure it's still the case, more COVID-19 patients than any other hospital system in the United yeah. States. And yeah, we've actually... That's actually pretty high up there in, from a global perspective as well. Yeah, uh, um, the number I've been using recently is about, we've seen about 76,000 COVID patients. Mm -hmm. That number is going to go up because we go back and we review uh, the medical records of people that came through. I believe our number will get to between 85 and 90,000 COVID patients. Now, most of those were seen in our ambulatory facilities, in our home care facilities. Um, the real serious people that were sick, really sick, were in the hospital. And that became the most difficult part, was managing you know, a all of our hospitals being almost 90% COVID patients. Um, and some of our hospitals are 100% COVID patients. And one of the ways that we were able to deal with it better than most is that we were able to what we call load balance. And in the book you reference, we talk about this because when one of our hospitals got very, very busy, I have my own transport network, I have my own ambulance services. Um, I have over a hundred vehicles. I was able to move patients from one geography and one hospital to another hospital in another geography. So, so not, none of our hospitals would ever get completely overloaded because I moved patients and I moved patients 60 miles, 50, 60 miles uh, from where they were originally so that we could provide the appropriate care. And um, the lesson here is that, and for everybody going forward, every healthcare organization, is that you've got to have a culture of preparedness and a culture of disaster preparedness. You have to have a strong infrastructure around emergency management and always have it in place and have the structure in place so that whatever happens, you can kick it into operations pretty quickly and so that you're not trying to figure out how to make it up in the middle of a crisis. That's a dangerous situation to be in. Yeah, and I think, Mike, that's something that comes through and maybe pivoting to the, the broader lessons learned. You know, I think what you refer to is the 13-point you know, the, the prescription going forward all the way through, as you say, planning, you know, emergency preparedness culture, all the way through to sort of creating the new normal. Um, it was interesting you talked about the, um, your other business, because I, you know, I know there's been a lot in the business circles discussion about the healthcare industry and will it be able to recover from you know, people 
concerned about going in. But as you look, and also your focus on people, and what struck me very much was, you know, the first priority was making sure your people were safe and well, because without that, you're not going to be able to treat the patients. But tell us a bit about as those learnings as you went through what, what you experienced. What you do see is the, the longer term learning and changes well, uh, that, that you see. Yeah, there are a lot of term learnings here that, that are multiple, of course. And, um, and, you know, there's many moving parts on this all of the time. But we have to be much, much better prepared in, uh, to make sure that we have adequate supplies to, deal, to, to be able to deal with a crisis of any sort. We were almost totally dependent upon getting our core supplies because we were fighting a war. So the munitions we needed to fight this war, if you use that analogy, were from China and overseas. There was very little domestic manufacturing of, of, of PPE, masks, gowns, etc., in the United States. So when the whole supply chain got disrupted, we're left with, you know, a shortage of basic. Uh, infrastructure that you need and that's something that has to be corrected that doesn't mean that we don't do business with countries overseas etc but it does mean that we have to do a lot more domestically and that's true for Ireland and it's true for the United States we were not as prepared as we should be at all uh, the stockpiles uh, that we had uh, were not you know fully equipped there when we didn't have enough inventory some of the inventory was outdated some of it was didn't have all of the parts, etc. We talk about that in the book. So that whole supply chain issue is something that we should never, ever, in a crisis like this, have to be scrounging around the world to try to find uh, essential equipment that you need to protect employees. The other issue, uh, one of the learnings here, by the way, is that you begin to become very innovative and creative in a crisis. It always happens. Yeah. It happened a dozen more time. If you go back over history, a lot of innovations occurred during a crisis. And so we became very innovative around telemedicine, virtual care delivery. We've had, we had a large telemedicine program here prior to COVID, but during COVID it exploded. So like the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, all of the people that even in my health system that were hesitant about telemedicine, um, uh, hesitant about whether or not it would work, uh, during the crisis to have to use it and that completely has now exploded and that's going to be a major major part of care delivery going forward The other lesson is that well hospitals are very very important. You need a large ambulatory outpatient network of services I have 800 ambulatory locations. I've got 23 hospitals, but I've got 800 ambulatory locations without those uh, And going forward in the delivery of healthcare, you're going to be in real difficulty because you can't be bringing everybody into the hospitals. It doesn't make any sense at all. A lot of stuff that's in the hospitals had to be taken out. The other issue going forward is we're going to be working remotely. A lot of our employees work remotely during COVID. Um, Pre-COVID, we felt like everybody has to come to the office. Everybody's got to be together socially and being together socially is important. But going forward, I know that I have a major, major portion of my workforce working from home or working remotely, and maybe coming to the offices one day a week, maybe two days a week. So it changes the whole real estate that you need. Um, so, and on the employee front, um, to the issue just raised Sean well ago, it's very important in a crisis like this, and it's important in any, whether you have a crisis or not, to be very closely connected with the employees on the front lines. Leadership has to walk the floors. Leadership is to get out of the office, walk the floors, enhance morale, provide, inspire, provide a sense of optimism. I was out on every floor of the hospital during COVID. Even though because of my age, I'm regarded as being in a high risk group, and I had physicians telling me, you should not go on the floors in the, in, the, in the COVID unit. I went to every COVID unit. Why? Because it's important to connect with the people who actually do the work on the ground every day. So too many of us in executive suites kind of hide in the executive suite and don't make the ongoing continuous connection with employees. That proved invaluable during the crisis and it's going, it proves invaluable even when you don't have a crisis. So there are lots and lots of lessons here. Uh, I will all be different going forward than we were pre-COVID. This has changed us forever. 
I don't think we are ever going to go back exactly the way we were before. I think we've been changed personally. Um, our whole perspective and life changes when you go through something like this. Um, you begin to think of your family different, your relationships different. You begin to think about what's possible. You know, you see the true character of people in a crisis like this pandemic. You see what employees do. You know, I had employees coming in all the time. It was the same in Ireland in the hospitals, even though they had families at home, kids at home, in-laws at home, and they're worried about their families. But healthcare workers are unique individuals. They run to the fire, just like firemen do. They ran toward the crisis. They did it every day, continuously, round the clock. So you get a great sense of the potential of people, which lets you think about, can we maximize you know, bottle that, that creativity that we saw during a crisis so that we can excel in what we do when we don't have a crisis. Yeah. No, Mike, and I know, I, I recall a video board meeting we had of the Smurfit board, both the Irish and the North American, and I remember you, you specifically mentioning that all business models will change in some respect because of this, because of the impact this has had. I think the other thing, and it's just resonated with me as you spoke about, a lot of the things we took for granted, the small things about being able to meet with family, travel, eat out. I think one of the major things we took for granted is the reliance we place on our healthcare workers. And I think you've seen that in the response around the world in terms of people realizing the sacrifices they make, the dedication that they have. And I think that, that, that'll, that will hopefully help us learn some of the lessons you just talked about in terms of planning, investment. Um, any final comment or observation at this point for, you know, for our delegates here in terms of, of what you've learned and what you've seen? I, I would be say that um, to everybody that, you know, we've gone through something that none of us have ever gone through before. I mean, but it's going to happen again. And what we do now is not sit back, uh, get complacent, thinking, you know, this is over. We can kind of, we can, re we can retire back to the old ways. Uh, we have to sit now and say, um, let's not be complacent. Let's plan for how we deal with a crisis when it occurs again. Both, not, both, as, a, both as a government and as individual businesses, not just only healthcare businesses. And one of the issues that we're working with today, we're we're in contact today with multiple businesses, non-healthcare, that have come to us to help them figure out how to um, prepare uh, emergency management um, infrastructure in their facilities for the future. So I think there's a positive aspect here. We learned a lot. We've got to use it. We've got to look forward with being, being optimistic. The possibilities that we have to do great things is pretty extraordinary. And so we should not, we should bottle this energy and this creativity that we've, that we experienced during COVID so that on healthcare, especially, and in other businesses, but especially in healthcare, so that we can improve the way we do work in the future. And last point, COVID demonstrated that, that poorer people, minority individuals, people in poorer communities were disproportionately affected. These are the communities we in normal times don't spend as much time dealing with. We serve them, but we don't focus. Now we have to make sure that we deal with the issues of inequity, uh, the inequities in access, the inequities in the delivery of care, and make sure that, especially for healthcare providers, we make sure we take care of everybody as equally as we possibly can uh, because COVID did discriminate and we got to make sure that when it happens again we're much much better prepared. Mike I think a great point to end with. Uh, first of all I want to thank you for taking the time uh, today with us. Um, wish you the best of luck. Um, we are you. coming into the the autumn and the winter and, and you and all your teams you know want wish them all the best and to stay safe. And I think on behalf of all of us, including, I suppose I, I consider myself a New Yorker and I thank you and your team for all you, you've done to help us navigate what could have been. Like we're not minimizing what has happened, but yeah. it could have been a lot worse without the leadership you, sh you, you showed. And, and uh, it, would be, your team. it would be good if we had national leadership, but we don't. Yes. Mike, thank Just you very much. Just on a political note. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean and Mike. And um, we have Mike um, online, um, zooming in from New York. Um, it's bright and early um, in the morning over there in New York, uh, Mike. So thank you so much uh, for rising early and being with us um, and to take some, some Q&A following your lovely conversation um, and inspiring conversation um, with Sean. Um, also, thanks so much for posting uh, your book. Um, many of your copies of your book, um, which is recently uh, published, I believe it's hot off the press, um, has been uh, published with regard to your learnings and the experience of you and your team in New York um, in leading during the pandemic. Um, so we will share that um, with our friends and colleagues here. So Mike, um, we have some questions that have come in um, from our delegates this morning. And the first question is from Donal Byrne, um, who talks about how in Ireland, um, we still have as our main focus of healthcare, the hospital setting. So with the expansion, and you talked in your interview um, with Sean about the role of telemedicine and telehealth um, and um, hospitals moving out and activities moving out to the home. Um, how do you think um, we can build upon this um, and the use of telemedicine and embracing telemedicine, both from the healthcare professional side of things and also from the patient um, and maybe indeed the caregiver um, to keep patients out of the hospital? Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And, uh, you know, this is not that early for us, by the way. You know, we typically start over here very early in the morning. So delighted to be with you. Um, one, uh, let me answer that question this way. Um, there is an excessive focus on in-hospital care because a lot of what goes on in hospitals increasingly should be outside the hospitals. Um, if, you, if, you, if your whole focus is making sure that anybody that gets ill has to go into a facility, you're never going to be able to accommodate uh, the, the provision of care for all of the people who need it. It's not possible. For example, most surgery going forward will be done outside the hospitals. A lot of our surgery is done outside the hospital. So there needs to be a dramatic expansion of non-hospital locations of care, ambulatory surgery centers, imaging centers, cancer centers, etc. And a component of that is obviously telemedicine. And I believe that virtual care is going to be a dramatic, um, a, a, there will be a dramatic acceleration of, an, a, a, of um, telemedicine and virtual care going forward. And the way to look at it is talk to your kids, um, talk to the 20 year olds, the 25 year olds and ask them how do they want to engage and access information, access care. If we, if we don't change, they will force us to change anyway because the new mode of delivery and the new mode of access is gonna be through, through te technology. And so for anybody that is resistant to this and saying I'm not moving in that direction, you're not gonna be in business long term because the current generation of individuals, including people coming out of medical school, new physicians, new nurses, that's the way they work. The public uses it all of the time in many other areas of, of, in, of, of in interest. So healthcare is no different here. I think we just got to be very, very innovative and focus and be long-term visionary and make sure that we get out of the hospital as much as we possibly can and you use tele te telemedicine as much as you possibly can also. Thank you, Mike. And this is a theme that has occurred a number of times this morning through a number of different sessions. And um, some of our carers um, who shared with us their experience during the pandemic in the care of children with cystic fibrosis here in Temple Street, um, and also the care of patients with cancer in St. James's this morning. Um, Emma and Catherine um, also spoke about their experience of their colleagues, patients and, and families embracing the use of telemedicine. Um, so hopefully that is a change and a change that we will bring forward into the next phase of the pandemic and into the future of our healthcare systems. Um, so Mike, we have a second question. Um, and that question is from um, one of our um, delegates who um, obviously your culture of preparedness um, that you spoke about in your interview with Sean. And I mentioned also in our introduction that this is something that we're seeking to do within our UCD MBA um, leadership and healthcare network is to um, 
think about the future, to think the unthinkable, so that we will be in a state of preparedness for whatever the next pandemic brings. Um, so for organizations that are still reacting and who haven't started preparing, what would you advise, Mike, from your experience that they should do first? Uh, well, if you have a leader in an organization that's not preparing and is not looking out to the future, is not forward thinking, um, then you may want to think about having a different kind of leader. Um, maybe there's leadership change necessary. Leadership is about managing the present. Um, uh, it is about um, selectively uh, getting rid of the past, and it's about creating the future. Leadership is about, the le there's a difference between management and leadership. Management handles the present. Leadership looks to the future. If you have a person in charge of an organization that isn't, is not looking to the future, then you, may, you probably don't have a leader. So that's something every organization has to um, uh, think about. The other thing is people become a little bit catatonic subsequent to a crisis. They begin to close shop and they begin to bring things in to, you know, closely and say, I'm so worried about, about everything that's going on. I got to focus just on today. And I think that's the wrong perspective. Um, so uh, you're not going to survive long term in any field if you're not going to, if you're not focusing on what you should be doing five years from now. And so to me, uh, I believe, you know, I have an old saying that uh, if you have the wrong people in the, in the places, then you change the people. And uh, sometimes you can't convert somebody. Sometimes it's easier, uh, and what I've often said, it's easier to change people than to change people sometimes, if you can get my meaning. If I can't get to change your attitude about looking forward, then I better, better think about changing you. And I do think organizations have to think that way. Leadership is about innovation. It's about creativity. Uh, if you don't have that in an organization, you're going to be, you're going to be left behind. Thank you, Mike. Um, and another theme that really struck me in your interview with Sean is um, the, the idea and the notion and, and the fact that there is unequal access to our health care and inequity of care and inequity of treatment. And we have seen this um, in a variety of different uh, settings globally. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of how we can best address that inequity in terms of access to care? Oh, I think it's the responsibility of every organization that's in healthcare and the responsibility of government that we make that a major, major focus of our attention over the next couple of years. But it, goes, it is more than just uh, the delivery of medical care. There is a difference between medical care and health. We're talking here about health overall. Uh, here in New York during COVID, the people that got uh, affected mostly by COVID were people were the resulting from over, that had obesity, overweight, that had diabetes, that were hypertension issues, cardiac issues, poverty issues. So, it, so the overall health issue is is much much bigger than just what hospitals and doctors and nurses deliver. It's all about the social determinants of health issues, the lifestyle and the behavior. So we've got to broaden our definition of health, and we've got to be thinking about how it is we improve the economic circumstances of these people, include, improve the housing circumstances of these individuals, include the nutrition, diet circumstances of these individuals. And that requires a collaboration between the formal healthcare organizations and all of the other organizations in, that, in those communities that can work together. But it starts with a commitment. For example, in New York right now, I am working uh, very, very deliberately and very in a, in a big focused way on about seven communities so that we can, with the leadership in those communities, based upon what it is they also think they need, make a, try to make a real difference in those communities over the next couple of years. And it's a refocusing of a priority of our organization. And I think everybody in the leadership position, whether it's healthcare or not, by the way, business leaders have to take a responsibility here too. They have an obligation to make sure that um, the community at large is healthy, and so not leave it up to just the people that are in the in the in the professional business of healthcare delivery. They have a responsibility as well. 
And Mike, to wrap up on a very positive note, um, I really liked in your conversation with Sean, where you talked about bottling the passion, the energy and the creativity uh, to excel outside of the crisis as well within the crisis. Uh, can you speak to us a little bit, a moment about that, just to end on a positive note? Um, well, there's a lot of positivity here. I mean, and I think we've got to focus on what's positive. Um, first of all, the, 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 the latent talent that exists in your people in every organization is extraordinary. Uh, what we saw emanate from people during this crisis was unbelievable. So if you focus on talent development, leadership development, continuous training of your employees, uh, continuous interaction with your employees, uh, enhancing the diversity of your employees and the diverse knowledge of your employees, and you know, organizations are about people. Organizations are about people's personalities, their feelings, and their desires, their hopes, their dreams. That's what organizations are about. Leadership has to make sure that you inspire this. And if we can continue to inspire that positive aspect and be upbeat. I mean, we went through this crisis quite, quite well. A lot of things didn't work well, but look at it overall. We were successful up to this point build upon that success, uh, compliment the people who did great things, feel good about yourself, feel good about the people that you work with, build that sense of community, that interdependence, and, uh, and look forward. Um, you know, the, the possibilities are just extraordinary, as I said when I talked to Sean. It's unbelievable what we can do if we focus on doing what's right all the time. And I would say that COVID proves how fragile we are. It proves, it demonstrates the gaps that we have, but it also demonstrates the, this unbelievably latent uh, positivity that exists in everybody when they pull together and they can do extraordinary things. We just gotta bottle it. And uh, leadership has to push it, drive it, and be excited about it. Lead, people follow people that, that um, employees will follow people if they see that there is hope and there is a dream and there is a positive outcome at the end. Um, and, and basically, that's what leadership is about anyway. So feel great about it. And know that the next time there's a crisis, we're going to be so well prepared, we're going to be deal with it so much better than we dealt with this one. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, um, you know, we're going through a difficult time, um, as you know, in Ireland and in Dublin right now. So um, to, uh, to have those inspiring words, um, and I love the notion of to bottle it, if we can bottle it. Um, Mike, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for joining us from New York and taking um, time out of your Saturday morning to be with us um, and to share um, your experience and your thoughts um, with us and with all our delegates. So it's been a pleasure and we hope to see each other um, on either side of the pond in person at some stage again. Thanks so I'm much. Looking forward, I'm looking forward to getting back. I haven't been back in a while, obviously, and I'm looking forward to when I can, when, the, when it's possible, I will be in Ireland, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, if, if at all possible. Again, okay. thank you all very much, and I compliment everybody for this conference. It's great. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.